Hello and welcome to News Click. Today, in the third episode of Signs of Our Time, we're joined again by Professor Ajaz Ahmed, one of the leading Marxist intellectuals in the world. Ajaz, welcome. Thank you. Today, I thought we should talk about the United States and China. Um, there's been, of course, you know, an escalation of words between the two countries. Uh, recently, the presidential envoy of Donald Trump, with the very special name of Marshall Billingsy, made a comment where he said that the United States has at one previous time, he meant with the USSR, with the Soviet Union, has previously spent an adversary, and these are his words, previously spent an adversary into oblivion. And he says that the United States is prepared to escalate the arms race with China in order to spend it into oblivion. Uh, this is a comment again by US Special Presidential Envoy Marshall Billingsy. Where are we now? in this what appears to be escalating war of words between the United States and China? Between the United States and the Soviet Union, there was an immense disparity of material power which uh, in favor of the United States. The USSR was emerging out, out of the Second World War, having lost about a third of its population actually and all of its industrial base, so to speak. The Soviet Union was actually a very poor country coming out of the Second World War, uh, even before that. But uh, So throughout that period, the Soviet Union was, in fact, materially far, far more uh, <clears throat> so that the expenditure on defense against, the, against uh, the United States and NATO and so on and so forth was an immensely large part of uh, the, it, 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 it did in fact means, mean that you could not build a consumer society, you could not, it meant an immense amount of hardship for the Soviet people and for the Soviet state. And there's no question about that. Secondly, the Soviet Union also took it upon itself to its great glory uh, to support as many uh, <clears throat> national liberation movements with arms and money and so on as it could possibly do across continents. Uh, so that was a very different kind of situation. Not only that, it also uh, committed itself to helping countries develop independ their independent economy and, and military power. Egypt is a classic case of that, a tremendous amount. And when the Egyptians actually just wrote off, just refused to pay the debts and so on, the Soviet Union could do nothing. Anyway. What you have now is that the United States is still the largest economy in the world. No question, the most powerful, the most deeply structured financial system and so on and so forth. So one should not underestimate the power of the United States. But it's, it is now at a very different point in history where the overall trajectory uh, is that of US decline relative to other powers in the world. It is now a highly indebted economy. Its economic power very largely centers on the power of its currency, which is effectively the, I mean, uh, we live in a dollar standard economy the way the world wants you to live on. Uh, so, <clears throat> but yet that is very, that is very vulnerable. 
Uh, whereas the, so that what you have is that in economic terms, this is on the whole a declining power. China is on the other hand a rising power uh, economically and most fundamentally it is the world's most productive economy. Uh, it's the most productive economy and it is the only truly organized economy so far as the great powers are concerned. So, so the, and its post military posture is of a very different kind, where it has, it is increasingly matching and even in some areas exceeding the United States in technological power. At the same time, its entire military structure is actually of a defensive nature. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so, so you cannot outspend China. The, the United States has been actually undermining its own economy through all these wars that it, it has been fighting um, at a time when it's actually economically declining. So that very many of the internal crises of the United States, in my view, are connected precisely to the kind of disbalance in the United States where it is essentially a military industrial uh, economy devoted very much to military at the expense of uh, internal social development. China, on the other hand, has been able to create an, an, an admirable balance between um, in the the, the development of the economy for its own population uh, as compared to the United States. Um, you know, you have, it, it, it's remarkable, something like 90% of the Chinese uh, population actually owns uh, its own homes. And by and large, not a mortgage or anything like that. Uh, whereas home ownership in the working class in the United States, and not only the working class, middle classes, is declining. And it has become, in fact, a source of household indebtedness, which means that households cannot spend on other kinds of consumption the way uh, they could if they were homeowners and so on and so forth. So that is one thing that you cannot. The other thing that is very important to understand in this is that, that, you know, the U.S. through its belligerence has created a situation, has forced China and Russia into a very close strategic uh, partnership. And between the great development of military technology in Russia and in China itself, the supersonic field and so on, uh, China has China has something like 165 supercomputers to America's 25. <laughs> you know, so in the technological fields, the disbalance is of a different order. And thanks to this very great strategic relationship that uh, that the Americans have actually imposed on on them, you have you have an interesting situation. China has a tremendous industrial base. Russia has a tremendous industrial base for military uh, development, for wep weapon systems and so on and so forth. At the same time, it has an enormous amount of oil. Now, China does not want to become dependent on Russia for oil. And therefore, it is looking for all kinds of uh, sources for petroleum and gas and so on, including Saudi Arabia, Iran, and other and so on. But there is that, that the great weakness of China is actually resource scarcity, uh, in particularly energy, but all other resources. And that is the only strength the Americans have. The military strength in the South China Sea. 
that is a real threat to China. And how that will shape up, we shall see, because that will also develop on the kind of alliances China uh, versus the United States are able to create and how those other countries see their future and so on. The real weakness of China is really the American power in the South China Sea, in which now India is try, trying to tag on to that and Australia is trying to tag on to that. So, well, let's, but, let's, but they did not uh, yeah. outspend China. Let's, let's just uh, go into that a little bit, because uh, I agree with you that the vulnerability is in resources, partic particularly energy resources. It's also clear that the United States strategy seems a little uneven because China continues to be the biggest trading partner of the United States. So you're going to war essentially with your major trading partner. This is quite different than the US, USSR um, right. you know, entanglement. It's quite different. But what was very chilling to me just a few days ago was the defense minister in Japan, Tara Kono, made a statement saying that Japan is no longer interested in merely having a missile defense shield, but Japan might want to produce weaponry or buy weaponry, which gives it a first strike option, first strike capability. We've seen aggressive moves from the United States. We've seen the Australians make some noises. This is the first that we've seen Japan be so clear about its ambitions for first strike. What's your thought about that? Japan was the great colonial power in the area. And Korea, China were part of the empire or part of China was part of the empire. So was Southeast Asia. This, this was also what the Japanese thought was the co-prosperity sphere and so on. Be, behind that was a very powerful tradition of militarist state, militarism of a very strong uh, kind go, going back to their old traditional feudal past, but right into the Second World War and so on. So there is that side of the ruling class in Japan which is nostalgia for that time when it used to be a great power in the area. And now, since with the, with the rise of China, so I'll, I'll come, come to that. The second thing I think one has to remember is that from being a great colonial power, it became a, a it was, it, it lost a war. And the modern Japanese state is a result of that American defeat of Japan uh, and uh, occupation of Japan. Um, some of it still continues, which whether or not Japanese call it occupation or not, but the, uh, so, so, so there's that. So I would say that, that Japan has always had, uh, a, had an ambivalent relationship with the, with the United States, where throughout the period when the Soviet Union was still there, uh, Japan saw itself right next door to the Soviet Union, saw itself as really being dependent of the United States for its defense um, architecture against, against the Soviet Union. Now, you know, there are different things happening. Uh, on the one hand, <coughs> North Korean nuclear power is directed against the Americans. Americans, and that means American presence, both in South Korea and in Japan, Okinawa and all that. Um, and North Koreans are threatening that if the Americans take any military action against them, we shall retaliate against, um, you know, their retaliation will come in Japan and North, North Korea. So first strike capability against whom? That is, that is one question. 
where does the threat, a military threat of that kind come? So they, on the one hand, have to resolve their relationship with the United States. Now, the other thing that occurs to me is that there is a kind of a right-wing patriotic sentiment in Japan, which has been for a long time clamoring to rebuild its own independent uh, military capability, to build its own independent nuclear force, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. in conjunction with the United States, but. So even now, this defense minister and uh, Obe and so on, what they're saying even now is in conjunction with the United States. You know, so on the other hand, there's a left liberal opinion in, in Japan, which is opposed to this dependence in America altogether. Um, so I think this latest statement of rejecting that missile defense um, and wanting to build its own. Uh, we, we have to see where it goes because the rejection of the uh, missile defense may come about and the building of that capability may not come about. So it actually makes Japan somewhat more independent of the United States because this business of that missile defense um, is something that is um, threatening both North Korea and, and China. And there must be some people in the strategic uh, establishment of Japan who must be saying that why get deeper into this because this is actually what is posing the threat to us. You know, there must be some realism in some circles in Japan that your real threat is that because of your involvement with the Americans, increasing involvement with the Americans, you're making yourself more, more vulnerable to North Koreans and so on. So we have to wait and see just where it goes in terms of Japan. How interesting. That, that's, that is a very interesting analysis, and I hope we'll come back and pick this particular point up. Ajaz Ahmed, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks.